to invite the uh, former ambassador of the United Kingdom to Ukraine, uh, His Excellency uh, Lee Turner, uh, who is uh, with us, uh, to make a great presentation of uh, his book, his diplomatic work, and uh, uh, maybe also some uh, background about the situation uh, in Ukraine. Uh, his assessment and answer uh, the questions of the uh, people who gathered today. Uh, we have the students of the university, we have some guests, um, including the uh, um, the people who are going to become students uh, this year, the uh, um, uh, members of two great uh, societies, let us say, the Kiev Junior Academy of Science and uh, the uh, group called Charm. Uh, these are the um, uh, students who are participating in various meetings of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of uh, NATO and other international organizations. Uh, and uh, so uh, they also sent some questions in advance. Um, I uh, uh, was uh, uh, really uh, honored to do this uh, uh, organize this meeting as I'm a former uh, uh, Chimney uh, scholar. This is the uh, British uh, Chimney program, the program that is uh, for uh, leaders of uh, all countries with which UK have relations. So uh, this is a, a program for studying in the UK and um, I um, really encourage uh, everyone when they're ready to apply to this program. Uh, during uh, this uh, uh, period, it was really a big uh, boost in the number of Chilean scholars who joined uh, the program. And uh, we are very grateful to the UK and to Lee for uh, this opportunity. And uh, so um, indeed, uh, um, Lee, uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to you and uh, welcome back to Ukraine. Uh, thank you for uh, being with us and uh, let us uh, start our today's event. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sergei. And it's really great to be talking to my friends back in Kiev. After uh, many years, I was ambassador in Kiev from 2008 to 2012 at a time of... Uh, relative uh, stability and uh, peace in Ukraine. Of course, it's been very shocking and dismaying to me, as to so many other people, what has happened in Ukraine in, since 2014, and then even worse since 2022. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk um, to a uh, PowerPoint show that I have called Lessons in Diplomacy. And this Lessons in Diplomacy is 12 lessons one lesson from each of my diplomatic postings over the years. I was a diplomat from 1983 until 2021. And before that, I was in I was a civil servant in the UK. And um, I'm hoping you'll find this uh, entertaining and interesting. It, it's not mostly about Ukraine, but I'm very happy to answer questions about Ukraine and about Russia later on. So, Sergei, if we can get the... Um, Slideshow up now. I will start talking to that for the next uh, half an hour or so. Um, okay, so yeah. yes, I'm trying to do this because I don't have anyone to help me. So uh, if all else fails, I can put it up from this end. Yes, uh, I'll share my screen in a moment. Um, Okay, so, well, this is, right. uh, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what we want to see. So this is the presentation. We can just go full screen there and then I'll, I'll say next slide from time to time and we can, uh, we can move it on. So um, this is actually myself in uh, 1981 in the mountains of Lesotho, which is one of the countries where I grew up. Um, why does anybody become a diplomat? Um, very often it's because in their childhood they have been, um, uh, traveling. And my father was a university professor. You need to go full screen. It's this one down at the bottom that looks like a little lectern, bottom on the right, um, on the right hand side, there's a little uh, thing that looks like a wine glass. You need to click on that's it, that one there. Um, 
Great. So we'll start in uh, 1966. Um, the next slide, please. Um, this is um, just go on one slide. Just click right on your on your computer. Oh okay. So we'll just go on to the next slide. Uh, what is that? I can't put it yeah, that's going backwards. We want to have the next next two two slides on. Okay. Right, great. So this is um 1966. This is me in Lesotho. Um I'm the one with no shoes on here. And my brother is there on the right. And in between are the two Teka Teka boys, uh, Reginald and Bernard, um, who were also children of an academic at the university. And uh, Reginald, the guy um, second from right, later became the Lesotho ambassador to Bonn in West Germany. Uh, Bernard, on second left, um, sadly, he became a DJ, um, a very different career path. And uh, sadly, he was killed in a car crash uh, coming back from jo Johannesburg to Lesotho in the 80s. Um, why do I show you this slide? Because it's symptomatic of my having grown up overseas in different foreign countries, and that maybe gave me a bit of wanderlust. Let's go on to the next picture, please. So 1974, we'll jump ahead, and here we are. This is 1974, and uh, I like this picture uh, particularly for talking to students because it shows really anybody can become an ambassador. Uh, the picture on the left is me in my uh, bedroom in Manchester in 1974. And you can see many signs here that I'm already interested in traveling. Um, top right in that left-hand picture, you can see two motorcycles. This is, of course, from the movie Easy Rider and shows me dreaming of the wide open spaces of, uh, of America. Top left, that picture kind of with orange people in it swimming is a poster from the Munich Olympics of 1972. And then the picture, which I'm afraid is politically very incorrect, of the woman with the oven gloves behind me. Um, if you have very good eyes, you may be able to read it. Said, it says Hand aufs Herz. And it's a German poster from a tr German trade union um, trying to, um, trying to uh, mount a campaign against the takeover of a German company by a British company. And I have no idea why, um, why they, they chose to have this image, but this is actually a German trade union poster. So many sim symbols in this picture of me, age 16, um, of the oh. fact that I was living and working overseas. Um, the picture on the right is also quite interesting. This, this picture in the back is me in Yorkshire, and behind me are these radar domes. And this is Filingdale's early warning station in Yorkshire. And it was designed to give advanced notice of a Soviet nuclear attack on the United Kingdom. And basically, it would have given the United Kingdom about 20 minutes notice to fire off its own nuclear deterrent before the Soviet missiles arrived. Let's go on to the next picture. So um, we'll start off with my year, years at work. I went to University of Cambridge, did a degree in geography. And then in 1979, I started work at the Department of the Environment. Next, next slide, please. Um, and my first lesson is don't judge a book by its cover. Because if you, um, you may think that um, work looks very glamorous, but actually these first four jobs that I did in London in the home civil service, not as a diplomat, were amongst the most interesting jobs I ever did. Let's go on to the next slide. This uh, picture is the Department of the Environment in London. I had a, my office was on the 17th floor of this tower block. And from time to time, I would look out of my window and imagine myself um, in 40 years time, having had a successful career. And I think I would be in a different window of this building. And that wasn't really a very inspiring prospect. Whereas when you're a diplomat in five years time or 40 years time, you can be anywhere in the world with a new job, new friends, maybe a new language as well. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Just got Sergey back, back in time, yep. So, and then I was working on transport policy, dealing with trucks, which sounds a bit boring, but actually we were denationalizing the National Freight Corporation, which was a state-owned trucking business, 
I spent a week with this guy, Joe Staines, um, living in his cab, the cab of this big truck. And we drove from uh, Lincoln in the east of England down to Rouen and Clermont-Ferrand down in France. And it gave me a real insight into the life of a long distance lorry driver. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So um, then I had a year in Germany working um, with the British Army of the Rhine, which in those days was defending against a possible Soviet attack on Central Europe. This is Berlin. This is the Berlin Wall. Um, you can see in the foreground the um, western side of the Berlin Wall. And in the background, about 300 meters behind, you can see the eastern side of the Berlin Wall. So it was about 300 meters wide with um, tank barriers and so on in between. And this gives you some idea of what the Berlin Wall looked like. We'll come back to the um, uh, to Potsdamer Platz, uh, how it looked a bit later in a later slide. Can you have the next slide, please? Um, great. So um, after I was in uh, Germany for a year, I came back and I worked in the Treasury. This is this building on the left for a year, um, dealing with Margaret Thatcher's economic reform policies. And then in 1983, I moved into this building on the right, which is the Foreign Office. And uh, you can see both of these buildings are grand 19th century buildings built at the well, actually, the, the Foreign Office was built in the 19th century. The Treasury was built mostly in the 20th century. Um, and they were, uh, they're both very grand central London buildings. Um, and when I joined the Foreign Office, I actually found I was working on El Salvador and Nicaragua. And it wasn't nearly as exciting as I expected. I was just answering letters from members of parliament about how much people in Britain disagreed with the government's policies on Nicaragua and El Salvador. In Nicaragua, the US, the United States, were trying to undermine a left-wing dictatorship. In El Salvador, they were supporting a right-wing dictatorship. And most people in Britain disagreed with both policies. And I was just answering thousands of letters. Very dull. So don't judge a book by its cover. These jobs back in the UK may look boring, but they weren't boring at all. Next slide, please. So uh, then I went on to Vienna, my first posting, 1984. Next slide, please. And um, if we could go on to the next slide. Yeah. And my next lesson is languages change everything. And this is really important. Um, languages completely dominated my life as a diplomat. It seemed when I was at school, high school, that I was really a language duffer. But as time went on, it became clear I could learn languages and they really affected my life. Next slide, please. Um, this is what the diplomatic life looks like. This is me um, in 1985 or so in Vienna at a diplomatic reception, actually in the residence of the British ambassador, where I later lived as ambassador. That's how you imagine diplomatic life. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, next slide, yeah, and that's what it really looks like. This is me having my dinner one day. Um, uh, you can see I've taken some uh, tin of stew and emptied it out into my plate. Still got that plate, actually, and that fork. Um, this is how my life really was, not glamorous at all. Don't imagine that diplomacy is necessarily glamorous and don't imagine that it's necessarily very fascinating all the time. Next slide, please. And um, I mentioned languages. This was a classic thing that I did in my first job in Vienna. I happened to be looking at the um, newspaper one Saturday and I saw there was going to be a big environmental demonstration in uh, the Heinburger Au, which is a place east of Vienna where they wanted to build a new hydroelectric power station in the center of the Danube River. And um, I thought that sounds interesting. So I got on a train and went to join the demonstration. And you can see here top right, a guy with a beard whose name is Kaspar Natze Zimmer. He was an early green politician in Austria. You can see the protests happening here. And this was all because I spoke very good German and this made it possible for me to really get under the skin of the country. <clears throat> so languages change everything. My second lesson. Coming on to the third lesson, let's go on to the next slide. So this was London 1987 to 91. I went back to London and did two jobs there. 
And my lesson is go for the hard jobs. Really go for the most difficult jobs you possibly can because they will stretch you. You'll see what you're capable of. And also your organization will see what you're capable of. You will be able to, to do your best. And um, I found that working in the most difficult jobs in the foreign office really prepared me for future jobs and brought my work to the attention of the organization. So let's go see what those jobs were. Next slide. My first job was dealing with the European community budget in the years 1987 to 89. Um, if I was doing a live presentation, I'd invite you to say, what, what strikes you about this picture? This is the European Council of December 1987, at which the heads of state and government of 12 European community member states failed to agree a new budget. And what's really striking in this picture is that there is only one woman in the room, who is Margaret Thatcher. And you can see that a lot of the men are having a good time. You can see over on the right there is Helmut Kohl having a good laugh, I think, with the Irish Prime Minister there. Um, and on the left, there's some other people who are smiling and grinning, Margaret Thatcher looking very serious. And although Margaret Thatcher is very unpopular in, in the United Kingdom amongst many people, um, I do have some sympathy for her because she spent her entire career surrounded by men in suits. And my job was dealing with the European Union budget and also dealing with the future of the euro, the plan to have a European currency, which the UK opposed, as we know, unsuccessfully. Very, very difficult job. I was often going home at three, four, five o'clock in the morning, preparing briefing for urgent meetings of the European Council. Next slide. I then did another job for two years dealing with counterterrorism. I'm there on the left. This is in... Um, in Thailand, and uh, we were, uh, I think in Penang, we were doing a, an exercise with the Malaysian military uh, on what we would do if, a, if there was a terrorist incident overseas that required the foreign office to become active. And for two years, I was the head of ops, meaning I was in charge of practical responses to a terrorist incident overseas. And we traveled a lot, we tried to prepare for the worst, that we'd be as well prepared as possible. And it was a really great lesson in the practical steps you can take uh, to deal with terrorism, as well as, the, um, as well as the theory of terrorism, which is very interesting. I've blogged about this. Uh, I'll give you the address of my blog later on. Please prepare your phone so you can take a picture of my blog address at the end of the talk. Next slide, please. So then we come to, um, go, just go on to the next slide. Uh, frozen for some reason. Uh, there we go. So next we come to Moscow, 1993 to 95. Um, it's just the next slide down there. That's it. Uh, Moscow, 92 to 95. And my lesson here is have a plan and break it. Why do I say that? Well, as I mentioned before, I was a real language duffer. When I joined the Foreign Office, um, I took an exam, a language aptitude test, to see if I was good at learning languages, and I got a really bad mark. They said, you're never going to learn a hard language. Um, but as it happened, my then wife uh, was a diplomat. She was a language genius. She already spoke Chinese and Russian. And... Um, so we were looking for a joint posting somewhere, and we thought about Washington, which we thought would be too boring, too much like, Mos like being in London. We thought of Brussels, which again seemed a bit too close to London. And the third option was Moscow, which meant I would have to learn Russian. And um, luckily, I discovered that when I went on a nine-month full-time language course that I was actually able to learn Russian, not by studying the grammar, which terrified me as... German grammar had done earlier and French grammar, um, but because if I found if I listened to it and immersed myself in it, I could learn Russian. And I got to C1 in Russian in nine months and C2 Russian a little bit after that, and then went on a posting to Moscow in 1992. So next slide, please. So in 1992, I arrived in Moscow and uh, that's it. Um, this is my Russian driving license. Um, for the first, this. Uh, um, so um, 
when I arrived in Moscow, uh, the first thing that happened was I was taken to a sort of Soviet office where there was a chap with a box camera, a big wooden camera. And this man took about uh, 30 copies of this picture. You'll see it's a kind of Soviet picture. It makes me look like a citizen of the Soviet Union, kind of killer robot here, um, this Moscow driving license. I think about 25 of the, of the pictures were sent off to the FSB and uh, the rest were sent to us at the embassy to use for things like this. Um, next slide. It was a time of immense um, tension in Moscow. This was the second of the two putches of the 1990s. You will remember there was a putch against Gorbachev in 1991. Um, and then in 1993, there was a putch against Yeltsin, which was during my time in Moscow. I describe this in my book, Lessons in Diplomacy, which is uh, coming out in September. And um, in a way, the tensions about the future of Russian society that we saw then, which were back in the 90s, was Russia going to become a communist country or would it become a liberal democracy? And in 1993, the forces of authoritarianism rose up against Boris Yeltsin and he was successful in putting the putsch down. So Russia remained a democracy. And now we are seeing Russia obviously going in the direction of an authoritarian regime again, although there are many people in Russia still who would like to have a democracy. So those same tensions that led to the putsch in Moscow in 1993, this is my picture actually, just by the Bibliotheca Imeni Lienina, um, uh, are still present in Russian society. Russia doesn't know what kind of country it wants to be. Next slide, please. This was a time when, for the first time, we saw an actual uh, casino uh, setting up in um, Moscow, an unthinkable thought uh, under communism, of course. Next slide, please. And then... Um, of course, uh, we also have Red Square completely unchanged. I remember taking my children to see uh, Lenin in the Lenin mausoleum in the 90s. And I said to them, look, you know, this won't be here long, Lenin. We've got to see him while you can. But of course, he's still there. Lenin is still in the mausoleum in Red Square. Extraordinary. Let's go on to the next slide. In fact, I think Putin said, um, if uh, President Putin said, if uh, if Lenin were to be removed, it would suggest that the entire communist period had been wrong. We can discuss that. So the next job was Hong Kong, 1995 to 98, based in London. Let's go on to the next slide. And my lesson here is make a difference. I was responsible for, as part of Hong Kong department, for around six and a half million Hong Kong citizens. Um, and um, the responsibility of being responsible for those Hong Kong citizens, about three and a half million of whom were also British citizens, was an enormous responsibility. And we were negotiating with China for around 18 years on the future of Hong Kong from around 1979 until the handover of Hong Kong to China in 1997. And make a difference. If, if the job you're doing is making a difference to people's lives, you will find that it's enormously more rewarding than otherwise. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, we did a lot of negotiations but in London, in Hong Kong, and in Beijing of the so-called Joint Liaison Group, which was a group of Chinese and British diplomats negotiating over the future of Hong Kong. This is my picture of the Forbidden City in, uh, in Beijing. Next slide. Um, and uh, this is Hong Kong, the view from my hotel. In those days, people said, nobody is building less than 80 stories in Hong Kong. Of course, Hong Kong is still a very important commercial center. Next slide. And some of the talks we had, this is the, um, uh, after one of the talks, we went for a drink. This is in Shanghai on the Bund. And um, you can see me in the a second from the left there. And uh, the lady in the middle actually is Caroline Wilson, who is a, a, a very brilliant foreign office diplomat. She is now um, our ambassador in Beijing and doing a very good job, speaks fantastic Russian. She's also been posted in Moscow, she speaks great Chinese, speaks very good German, so a really top diplomat. Let's go on to the next slide. So on to Berlin, um, and next slide. And uh, my lesson here is about pendulums and specialization. And in the Foreign Office, there's a constant pendulum going between whether you should be specialized or whether you should know a little bit about everything. 
And sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other in the Foreign Office. And my recommendation to you is that we're heading into an era of increased specialization. Most people really have to be experts in something. And you should think about this when you're coming to decide your career choice. If we go on to the next slide, we saw uh, Potsdamer Platz in 1980 earlier on. When I arrived in 1998, 18 years later, next slide, um, you can see that um, uh, Potsdamer Platz had changed completely. Um, if you look very closely at this picture, it's very hard on your computer screens, I know, but um, down, down bottom left where that road comes between the two buildings, um, there is a little line going across the street, and that is where the Berlin Wall was, going right through the middle of Potsdamer Platz. So the Germans really did a lot of great work uh, after reunification. Remember that this was um, only less than 10 years after reunification, they built the whole of this Potsdamer Platz here. Next slide. And during my time as Councillor EU and Economic in the British Embassy in Bonn and Berlin, I was dealing primarily with the uh, epidemic of mad cow disease, BSE, bovine spong spongiform encephalitis, I think, or encephalopathy. Um, and bottom right, the introduction of the euro, which of course came despite Britain's best efforts to stop it from happening. Uh, and the cash euro was uh, introduced in the year 2000, I think. So let's go on to the, uh, 2002, sorry, January 2002. Let's go on to the next slide. I then had a completely different job for four years. Uh, go on to the next slide. Um, my lesson here is work isn't everything. Um, why do I say that? I, I went to a course in the London Business School on one occasion um, where the speaker to, spoke to about 20 upwardly mobile British diplomats. And he said, how many of you are going to make it to the top of the Foreign Office? And the answer was only one of us, one out of the 20. And this speaker said, you better make sure you have something else in your life. Very good tip. And in my case, in 2002, my then wife um, took over my job in the British Embassy in Berlin, and I had four years, go on to the next slide, I had four years of um, looking after the children. And this was really, this is my daughter, my children, Anna and Owen, in the garden of our house in, uh, in Berlin, making a snowman. Next slide. Um, and I also did all the cooking and shopping and so on. Um, this is me making a cake. Nobody died, I'm happy to say. Um, and why do I show you this? Because um, the chance to take a career break of this kind was a fantastic opportunity. I was very lucky. Not every man is in a relationship with a, with a partner where uh, he can take time off work in this way, that the partner earns enough that we could do this, or that the employ employer, in this case, the foreign office, is flexible enough that I could take four years career break and then come back and continue my career. But I always say this was the best four years of my working life, uh, being a, a stay-at-home dad. I also, um, let's go on to the next slide. Um, I also um, started writing for the Financial Times. You can see here some of the articles I wrote, some of them about sexual politics, some of them about um, uh, travel. And I also wrote my first thriller, if any of you fancy a good thriller to read, I recommend Blood Summit. It's about a, a terrorist attack on uh, a summit in the Berlin Reichstag in Germany. Um, so my four years as a stay-at-home dad were fantastically valuable. And of course, best of all, I developed a better relationship with my two children than would have been thinkable if I had never done that. Let's go on to the next slide. So then I came back to work. Next slide. And um, I found it enormously difficult to get a job. Of course, millions of women have had this experience when they've had children, they've left the workforce for a while and they've come back in. Nobody knows who they are and nobody really values what they've been doing while they've been having children and bringing up children. So coming back to the workforce is difficult. And I found this too as a man who'd been taking four years off work. Uh, but I did get a great job as director of overseas territories. Let's go on to the next slide. And why do I say embrace responsibility? Because again, as with my Hong Kong job, I was responsible for 250,000 people living in the remaining British overseas territories. There are around 14 of them. 
including places like the British Indian Ocean Territories, that's top left, St. Helena, that's top right, Bermuda, the one at the bottom there. And um, there are enormous lessons. We can learn an enormous amount from the overseas territories. Um, that, For example, that tortoise top right, that's Jonathan, the tortoise. Um, he's nearly 200 years old. He's been living in St. Helena for around 150 years. And he's been living there in stability. Nobody has eaten him or thrown him over a cliff or set fire to him, done anything with him. And he goes on living there on St. Helena. And that shows you how stable St. Helena has been for that enormously long period since uh, Jonathan arrived there in, in the 19th century. Let's go on to the next slide. Here are a few other territories. Top left, the Falkland Islands. When we negotiated with the Argentines, we always referred to them as the islands because they wanted to call them the Islas Malvinas. Uh, top right, Montserrat, a territory which was completely destroyed by a volcano that you can see in the background there. Tens of uh, around 10,000 people were evacuated from the island. They had to go and live in the United Kingdom. And then in the bottom, that's uh, my driver, Granville, with um, the governor's Range Rover. You can see it's got no number plate, it's got a crown instead. Um, that's in Anguilla. There's a good story that goes with that, but uh, I need to get on. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, then I came to Kiev, uh, 2008. Um, again, I was lucky. My predecessor uh, went on to another job unexpectedly. They needed somebody who spoke Russian or Ukrainian. In those days, I could still go there only speaking Russian. Um, so I went to, to Kiev in 2008. Let's go on to the next slide. And... Um, the lesson here is build your brand. When I was talking to an ambassador before I went, she said to me, when you're an ambassador, you really have to think about what people back in London know about you. You have to do something to attract the attention of people so they know you're there. And in my case, I started doing blogging. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, I always show people these pictures. I know I don't need you to show you these pictures because most people around the world don't know really what Kiev looks like. I show them this picture of this gentleman ice fishing in the Dnipra. Behind there, you can see other people also ice fishing. Go on to the next slide. I like to show them this beautiful picture of, um, of the uh, Kievskaya Lavra. And I tell them that you know Kiev is one of the most beautiful capital cities in the world. I point out that Kiev was a thriving large city at a time when Moscow uh, was still a swamp in the woods, um, and that Ukraine has this great history. And I try to impress upon them what a splendid place Kiev is and how independent it is. I've, I've written a lot on my blog about Kiev and Moscow, about the uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, about why Vladimir Putin wanted to invade Ukraine in order to keep his position um, because he's, he's terrified of democracy coming from Ukraine, and he knows that if there was democracy in Russia, he might not win the next election. That's what democracy means. And so he had to invade Ukraine, he thinks, purely in order to keep himself in power. It's nothing to do with the European Union. It's nothing to do with NATO. It's nothing to do with supposed Ukrainian Nazis, who, of course, is a complete myth. Um, it's all to do about with keeping Vladimir Putin in power. So I, I often give these lessons to people outside Ukraine. Happy to talk about that. I know that my audience today knows this all very well. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, I mentioned blogging and social media. I started writing a blog, which was, first of all, just on the British Embassy site. Then it went on Ukraine Kadumka, which was a website in London, a Ukrainian language website. Then it went on Diela, which was a Russian language website in Kiev. Then it went on Ukrainska Pravda, um, and people were looking at it in enormous numbers. And it made a big difference to my uh, presence and my time in Kiev. Next slide. Um, these were some of my Twitter followers at one point. Next slide. Um, this is meeting Olga Kirilenko in the Hyatt in, um, in uh, Kiev. Interesting to see that she is drinking a glass of water. I'm having a glass of champagne. This is how it is if you're a top model and actress. Also, she's looking at me as if she's really fascinated by what I'm saying, as if she's maybe a little bit in love with me. But don't forget, she's an actress. You know, She's probably thinking, how soon can I get away from this guy? 
Um, also very interesting that I got talking to her because when she arrived at the reception, 200 men came around her and started talking to her and I wasn't amongst them. And I noticed some way off there was a there was an older woman standing by herself. So I went and talked to this other older woman and she only spoke Russian. So I chatted to her and then another couple came over who also only spoke Russian. They didn't speak English. So I was chatting to them and it turned out, and then Olga saw that, um, saw that I was chatting to her mother and her sister and her brother-in-law or perhaps the, her brother and her sister-in-law. And so she came over to join us. And so I had 15 minutes talking to Olga Kirilenko in Russian and in English and in French. So this is a good lesson. If you don't speak languages, you should learn them now and you'll get a chance to talk to Olga Kirilenko. Uh, next slide, please. So then I went to Istanbul. By this time, um, uh, unfortunately, my marriage had come to an end. I had a very lovely um, uh, new partner who is Turkish. And um, I took a posting in Istanbul as consul general in Istanbul. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. Um, and my lesson here is immerse yourself. If you're a diplomat, or indeed, arguably in any job, um, you really want to do your job well. You want to get under the skin of the country that you're in. You want to be a total expert in everything to do with your job. So immerse yourself is my 10th lesson. If we can go on to the next slide there. Um, this is me in, uh, we'll just nip through these because we're nearly at the end. This is me in Istanbul. I was in charge of... Um, uh, commercial business, uh, trade and investment between Turkey, which at that time was growing very quickly, and the UK. Next slide. Um, I was also um, responsible for uh, South Caucasus and Central Asia. These pictures are from uh, Tajikistan, top right, and Uzbekistan, bottom in the middle. And of course, we had the Gezi Park protests during the time I was there. Very violent time in Turkey. Next slide. Um, and then I came to Vienna as ambassador, my final diplomatic post. Next slide. Um, my lesson here is give something back. When you're at the end of your career, you can really, I don't know if being a diplomat makes you wiser, but you certainly have a lot to talk about. And people said to me, you know, you should really um, do some, give some lectures, teach people a bit about what you've learned. Next slide. So I did a lot of that. And um, just go on to the next slide there. So uh, we had Prince Charles, now King Charles, came to visit us during my time there. I was very much involved in Brexit. You can see me here on the 31st of January, 2020, uh, 2020 taking down the uh, European Union flag um, outside the British Embassy at, in the dark. Um, very sad moment for me, since I thought taking down the EU flag was a very bad thing to be doing. Next slide. Um, we also had COVID, of course. I say in my book, Lessons in Diplomacy, COVID and uh, and Brexit, neither of them was really a great blessing. Next slide. So to summarize, 1979 to 2021, next slide. Um, on the left, this is me in 1979, hitchhiking around America before I started work. And on the right, this is me giving my farewell speech at the British Embassy in Vienna. And we'll go on to my final lesson in diplomacy. Next slide. So three tips on being a diplomat. You can talk about these in more detail later if you're interested. Just be an expert, focus on people. People are absolutely everything. And be long term. It's very difficult to take your time these days with social media and so on, but sometimes you must do that. Next slide. And three tips on being an ambassador. Live up to it. Everybody thinks that you're clever and wise, so you, and you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, have an opinion. That's the most important thing. You've have got to be the top expert on the country you're in or the job you're doing. And thirdly, do what you love, because people will notice the difference. Let's go on to the next slide. So what have I been doing since I retired in 2021? I've been writing and blogging. Next slide. Um, these are the books I've written. Please take a picture of this if you've got your phones handy. This is um, These are the books that I've published since 2021. Blood Summit is a thriller set in, um, set in uh, Berlin, as I mentioned before. Palladium is a thriller set in um, Istanbul. Eternal Life is a science fiction book. 
and Seven Hotel Stories are uh, dark feminist humor. I write these stories for my partner, who is a hotel um, a general manager. I write a new one for her birthday each year. There are 14 of them now, and the first seven are published in this in this book. So they're, they're all great fun. Next slide. Um, this is my um, blog, arleeturner.com. Again, feel free to take a picture of that and do sign up for my blog. You'll see I write quite a bit about, um, about Ukraine and Russia. Um, this was a recent interview I gave on Times Radio in the UK about why Putin launched his war and why it matters to the West. Very important why it matters to the West. A lot of people in America, for example, think it's nothing to do with them. They're wrong. And I explain why that is. Um, and then finally, next slide. Um, this is my new book, uh, Lessons in Diplomacy. It's coming out in September. And Sergey, I think you have circulated um, the link to the, um, to the uh, Bristol University Press website. And if you pre-order the book uh, before the end of April, uh, this is a link. There's a, I think Sergey has uh, circulated um, a code that you can use to buy the book for half price. So it's an incredible discount they're giving at Bristol University Press. Do, do order a copy of Lessons in Diplomacy now and it will be delivered to you. It's a, it's a great read. It's in, it's in English and it's, it's great fun. It has the same kind of tone as this lecture I've just given you. So uh, that, if that encourages you, I hope it does. So I'll finish there and I'm very happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much for your patience in listening to me. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lee. Uh, thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, so, dear participants, uh, uh, please uh, share uh, your contacts with me. I will uh, type my email in the chat, and uh, um, you will be able to get uh, the details and uh, invitations to our uh, subsequent uh, events, uh, including also surely the uh, details about the book and. Uh, so uh, this is the mail just uh, in a moment i'm typing it right now in the uh, chat uh here it is um and um uh, well sorry I, I missed the dot but uh, you will add the dot to gmail.com uh, now uh, there is uh, a number of questions that uh, participants uh, wanted to ask uh, first of all um i will just uh, read out some of what uh, already uh, was uh, sent by the participants and uh, then maybe i will give floor uh, to uh, a couple of people in the studio um, with respect to um uh, answering uh, th these questions and uh, so uh, some of the questions were um, about uh, surely uh, the situation in Ukraine, uh, your overall assessment based on your uh, great uh, international experience and uh, knowledge and uh, some of the questions from the students were the following. Uh, is it true that the world is uh, watching the war in Ukraine like a fight in a boxing ring uh there is substantial help but on the other hand it's not enough to defeat the enemy uh, another question uh, what are the prospects for us for the youth in ukraine in your opinion uh, we do not want to leave ukraine uh, we were both in the independent country of ukraine and uh born sorry in the independent country of ukraine and uh, we do not have nostalgia of the soviet union but uh, we know from the literature that uh those were terrible times for democracy, people's rights, and freedoms. Uh, is the best of job difficult? Uh, in which countries uh, besides Ukraine have you been well already answered during your presentation? Uh, is it difficult to adapt to life in different countries because of the difference in culture? Well, to some extent, you already answered this as well. Um, now, what does an ambassador do on their first working day in their position in another country? And uh, how problematic is long-term absence of Ukraine's ambassadors uh, to some of the uh, key countries. So basically, these were the questions answered, uh, sorry, the questions asked in advance. And um, before you answer them, uh, maybe you could uh, let, uh, and well, I'll just let uh, people uh, raise their hands in Zoom. Uh, and uh, we have a uh, well, couple of minutes to um, ask uh, more questions before you start answering. Great. 
Well, shall I just start answering those questions while other questions come into you, Sergei? Okay, hey, that's that's a good uh, arrangement. Sure. Okay. okay. So, I mean, the first question: the world is watching like a boxing match um, and not doing enough to help Ukraine. There is some truth in this, and I think that Ukraine has a constant task to persuade and convince the world that this matters to them. You'll see that uh, my latest blog I've written on my website about this is explaining why the conflict in Ukraine matters to countries such as the United Kingdom, or most importantly, the United States, where there is a large sector of opinion that believes that really it doesn't matter to people in the United States who wins this war. And on the contrary, of course it matters, because if Russia is allowed to win this war, then every country around the world will think that it can invade its neighbors and steal their land. And the United States and other countries will be in a much more difficult security environment. Plus, of course, if uh, if Russia seizes the whole of Ukraine and starts um, putting its armed forces on the border to um, other Western countries, to Poland, for example, um, then um, we will be in a much more difficult security situation. So, of course, the Russia-Ukraine war matters enormously to all Western countries. But Ukraine, most of all, needs to keep making the message that this matters to Western countries. And just as Ukraine has the terrible, difficult task of fighting the war itself, it also needs to fight the information war to explain to people around the world why it is that this war matters to them. And that is almost as important as fighting the war itself, because without persuading the world that the war matters to them, then the world will not provide the arms and the economic and the political support that Ukraine needs to win the war. Your second question is, what are the prospects for Ukraine? I mean, I think the Ukraine can win this war and should win this war, uh, but of course it needs support from other countries to help it to do that. And in particular, it needs weapons. And there are always reports around that maybe the US, the United States is going to provide the weapons that Ukraine needs. I very much hope it will. Uh, very difficult for Ukraine to prevail by itself against Russia, although it has been doing an absolutely fantastic job. There is always the possibility that the Russian system will collapse on itself. We saw this in June, 2023 when Mr. Prigozhin led a rebellion against Vladimir Putin, when Prigozhin himself, leader of the Wagner Group, said that all the arguments that uh, President Putin had advanced for the war were nonsense, um, which of course we all know already, but for Prigozhin to say that was very significant. Um, so it's possible that the Russian side might collapse, that the elites around Putin will finally say, we've had enough, this is crazy, this is a pointless war, uh, we want it to end. Uh, but of course, you know, President Putin has spent 20 years trying to make it hard to be for him to be overthrown. So we can't count on that happening. People ask, is the is an ambassador's job difficult? I mean, it's an enormous privilege, as I said before, to be an ambassador. If you're a British ambassador, before you go on your first posting, you meet the Queen and uh, now the King. Uh, that's an extraordinary privilege. And of course, you're in charge of an organization, which may be small in a very small country or big in a big country. For the embassy in Ukraine is a big organization as fits the importance of Ukraine as a country. So it's, it's a difficult job, but it's enormously rewarding. So I'd recommend it to anyone. And then the question, is it hard being a diplomat? Yes, I mean, on the one hand, the job is an unparalleled one in terms of interest, in terms of your ability to discover the world, your ability to learn languages. I've learned many languages. I've lived in many countries. I've had an, I've had a blessed career. I've been very lucky. Uh, on the other hand, it's not great for your family. Um, you know, where are your children going to go to school if you're moving from country to country every three, four, or five years? Um, what is your spouse or partner going to do if you're traveling to a new country every few years? And in many countries, the spouses of diplomats are not allowed to work. You know, what if your spouse has a career? So there's all sorts of difficulties there. I talk about this quite a lot in my book, Lessons in Diplomacy. I've got a whole chapter about, about this. Um, question, what do you do on the first day as ambassador? <clears throat> Very often you try to get to know your team. 
Your team is a really important part of your work as ambassador. You have to work with them very closely. So I think on my first day, I actually, in Vienna and in Kiev, I actually gave a talk to my team to introduce myself, to talk about myself, to say what I wanted, to explain why the work of the embassy was so important. And that's one of the first things you do. Another thing you do very early on is go to see the head of state and government of the country you're accredited to. For me in Kiev, that was uh, President Yushchenko I went to see, and I talked to him a little bit in my very bad Ukrainian. Um, I went on learning Ukrainian during my time in um, in Ukraine for four years and had uh, two weeks or three weeks in Lviv at one point, uh, staying with a very lovely family and speaking only Ukrainian. But I'm afraid my Ukrainian is not good now. And uh, since then, I've learned Turkish, which gets in the way of my Ukrainian. But um, so those might, might be two things you do on your first day. And the question about the absence of Ukrainian ambassadors around the world, I didn't know there was an absence of Ukrainian ambassadors around the world. I'd need to know a bit more about that. But I, I do think that uh, Ukraine and every country needs to have ambassadors around the world to represent its interests. We see this with the United States, which is very slow at appointing ambassadors um, when there's a change of president. So it often means that if you have a change of president, that there is no American ambassador in many countries for months or even years and that undermines American diplomacy and American um, power around the world. Um, so every, every country needs its ambassadors. So I've answered briefly those six questions, and I'd be happy to answer another question if somebody has one. I'll give the floor uh, there is Ivan at least. So, so uh, please uh, go on. Uh, um, is it Ivan who is asking? Yeah. Hi. Yeah, so uh, how do you think, why, what's the difference uh, in help from other countries to Ukraine, like from the more Eastern countries and smaller ones like Latvia, Lithuania, and so on, and uh, more Western countries, like why they act faster in the meanings of okay. uh, helping? Let's, let's go on to the yeah. next. I see we've got at least five questions, and I've only got another six minutes, so I'll we'll take a few questions. Okay. Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, uh, so, well, my question is not specifically about Ukraine, but rather, um, you know, what was the reaction of the British Embassy when the Soviet Union collapsed? Uh, you were in Moscow at the time, I suppose, and I, I'm just interested what uh, what uh, what was the feeling in the Embassy? Okay, next one. Margarita. Um, hello, uh, thank hello. you for your uh, uh, lecture. I, I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think? Is it possible that there will be a war between NATO and Russia? And if Ukraine lose, uh, there will be the third world war. Varvara? Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes, so I have actually two questions. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you very briefly, like for your fascinating presentation and like the life story that you told us. And uh, I also appreciate your photos. I, I think you have very like good skills in photography, um, and like the support of Ukraine and its people. Uh, so the first question is. Uh, actually, did you feel like homesickness, and how do you actually deal with it? Because um, I'm also my mom is a diplomat, and I'm traveling the world a lot, and. <laughs> It's difficult. I really feel like I want to stay home, but at the same time, travel in the world and uh, yeah. like this. Yeah. So that's one one of the question. And the second one: Do you see any diplomatic uh, solutions, um, like for the ongoing okay. war? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sophia. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, my name is Sophia. I'm from the organization Charm, and I'm very happy to have uh, an opportunity. Uh, to talk uh, with uh, people uh, with person like you miss turner and so my question is um what were the most memorable or special moments during uh, you stay in ukraine uh, in kiev thank you thanks uh, yeah, maybe yeah. should uh, i just answer those questions and then we'll see if you've got time for any more okay and uh, then uh, i will give you the floor and uh, so let us uh, keep some more questions in the waiting right Okay, um, so the first question, um, why do some countries give more help than others? And I think there's a pretty clear dividing line between those countries that have experienced Soviet occupation 
uh, such as the Baltic states in particular, but also Poland and some Eastern European countries and countries which are further away. And those countries which specialize in their dealings with the former Soviet Union. So um, those countries generally, um, which have close experience of what the Soviet Union was like or what Russia has done to them, including the United Kingdom, which has suffered several assassinations on UK territory uh, by, organized by Moscow, are very critical of Russia and are very prepared to step up with arms and financial help. Countries further away are intrinsically more skeptical. But then there are other countries like, for example, um, uh, Hungary or, uh, or Austria, which are really tend to th say it's not their problem. And what we've seen is that as the war has gone on, some of these countries, and I'm thinking, for example, about Germany, which previously didn't give much help, have now become to, begun to give more help because they've seen how terrible this war is. And this comes back to the point I was making earlier, which is that Ukraine needs to continue a massive information campaign to explain to people what the war is like and the costs of it and how appalling it is because some people say the only thing that will persuade more countries to help Ukraine is another terrible atrocity if Russia does something really bad. And none of us want that to happen. Um, so Ukraine really has to continue to explain to people what's happening in this war. How did the British Embassy in Moscow react when the Soviet Union collapsed? I remember this very well because uh, I was actually in London and the embassy in Moscow was very good. They said, this is a huge historical moment we need to set up embassies immediately in all of the 15 successor states to the Soviet Union, i.e. Moscow and the 14 others. And the Foreign Office said, you must be joking, we don't have that much money. You know, are you crazy? You don't understand what's going on. But actually, the um, embassy in Moscow was right and the Foreign Office was wrong. And it took until the new millennium to establish the last embassy in the former Soviet Union, which was in Kyrgyzstan, in Bishkek. And um, the embassy in Moscow actually had very good analysis of the situation uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. And if you read my blog, um, I've got a Ukraine-Russia war explainer, and I go into some detail about the history of this, how it happened, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, um, the Bielovitia Accords in 1991, the referendum in Ukraine in 1991, um, and then, of course, um, the fact that Russia agreed to all this. And then Russia, of course, in 1993, introduced the Russian ruble uh, in summer 1993. And with that act introducing its own currency, Russia basically said to the other 14 um, ex-Soviet republics, you're on your own now. You are now independent countries. You need to introduce your own currencies and your own financial policies. So it was Russia that broke up the Soviet Union. We must never forget this. And um, we must not believe any of this nonsense about anybody else breaking it up. Could there be a war between Russia and NATO? Unfortunately, yes, there could. Um, it would make no sense for Russia to attack NATO. And of course, NATO has not attacked Russia at any point. Um, for Russia to attack NATO and start World War III would be an absolute catastrophe for the whole world including Russia, of course, just as attacking Ukraine in 2014 and 2022 was a terrible mistake and disastrous for Russia. And unfortunately, there is the problem that although it makes no sense for Russia to attack Ukraine, it has done it. And this has led to a cataclysmic decline in the standards of living, uh, standard of living in Russia as well as, of course, for all the problems in Ukraine. So the fact that something makes no sense and is completely stupid doesn't mean that it won't happen. And there is always a risk that Russia will do something or that um, the leadership in Moscow will decide to do something that is really against the interests of the Russian people. Someone asked, is it, are you often homesick? Um, of course, um, maintaining... Uh, for diplomats to maintain their relationships with people back home is always difficult. And for me, with my children, when I was overseas, I tried to bring them back to the UK regularly so they could see their family, so they could feel they were British, they had a home, very important for me. 
um, but it's none, none of this is easy and you have to really work very hard at it to maintain relationships and to keep your family together. And is there a diplomatic solution to the war? You have to keep open all diplomatic solutions. Uh, you have to keep working to try and solve the war rather than by military means to solve it by diplomatic means. Unfortunately, I don't see any landing zone at the moment because a uh, landing zone for an agreement because Ukraine can't agree to give its land to Russia um, in exchange for peace. Ukraine can't think of doing that because that would legitimize the whole war. And President Putin, unfortunately, can't give up the land that he's stolen or tried to steal because that would mean that the whole war was a waste of time. So he would be finished politically in Russia. Um, so it's very difficult to see what a diplomatic solution could look like, but we should keep trying in the hope that Russia will withdraw its forces and go back to a peaceful settlement, which would be far better for Russia than continuing to fight the war, of course. Um, and finally, my most special moments in Ukraine, well, there were many of them, really. Um, I very much enjoyed traveling to all parts of Ukraine, including Crimea and uh, the far west to Odessa and down to um, the other side of Moldova, um, to Transcarpathia and so on, all those distant parts, and of course, to Donetsk and Luhansk and Slavyansk and all these places um, in the far east of Ukraine. I always say I never met anybody um, uh, apart from the Russian military forces in Sevastopol who wanted Crimea or any other part of Ukraine to be part of Russia. Um, we must never forget that in 2010, when they had the elections in Ukraine, there was an election in Crimea and there was a pro-Russian party, it was a candidate there called the Russian Unity Party, led by um, the man who is uh, now the so-called prime minister of uh, Crimea, appointed by Russia. And um, in that election in 2010, Ukrainians in Crimea had a free vote. Uh, all the population of Crimea voted uh, and could vote for any party, for the Party of the Regions or for the Russian Unity Party or for Batkivshina or any party. And how many of them voted for Russian Unity Party? 4%. So that's how many people there were in Crimea before 2014 who actually wanted to be part of Russia, roughly 4% of the population. We should always remember that figure. So I've, I've tried quickly to answer those six questions. I don't know, Sergei, if we have time to answer any more. Uh, from my point, yes. Uh, so can I give the floor to three people we have uh, hands raised, if you don't mind? Uh, so, okay, uh, Nazari. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much one more time for your great presentation. It was very inspirational for me, especially. So I just have a quick question. Um, what key challenges, uh, not taking into account the Ukrainian crisis, uh, do you see in nowadays world and uh, in, in general geopolitics and uh, how the global community can affect uh, international stability and uh, what do you think the international community needs to address to this uh, crisis? Hmm. Sure, no. Just a small question. Yeah, okay. Yeah. My question is, uh, uh, what specific duties does the ambassador uh, have in maintaining a relation uh, between uh, British and Ukraine? And uh, we have one more, Irina. Uh, thank you a lot for our meetings. And I want to ask, what lessons of uh, diplomacy did you learn while uh, you working in Ukraine? and so uh, which can be applied in future relations with uh, other countries uh great uh so so far uh, that's the questions we've got so if you have some more minutes to answer we'll be grateful <laughs> great okay well let's take them in reverse so um what i learned in ukraine and impact for relationships with other countries i mean it was my first ambassador job and um i found the responsibility very huge i found it really very meaningful to be representing the United Kingdom in Ukraine. And I'm full of admiration for my successors who have been through much more difficult times than I had. Um, we had um, uh, Simon Smith, for example, who was dealing with the, uh, the Maidan and all the instability around that and the taking of Crimea. Um, 
and we had um, uh, Judith Goss, who uh, was also facing all kinds of crises, and then we had Melinda Simmons. Really, you know, all of these people had very tough jobs, and um, the main thing I'd say I learned was really about, as I said in my um, talk, taking the work very seriously. These are enormous responsibilities and you've got to really commit yourself 100% to trying to do the best job that you can, both to support your own country and to try and create the best possible relationship between your country and the one to which you are posted. And of course, in the case of a great big crisis like we have now in Ukraine, the ambassador's job is more important than ever. So great respect to everybody. I think it's Martin Harris, who's now the ambassador in um, yes. in uh, Kiev. You know, he's got a huge job, so uh, hats off to him too. Um, what about the role of the ambassador in improving relationships? Well, that's absolutely fundamental. Um, you will have seen my three lessons for ambassadors that I gave in my talk. If you read the book, you'll see I, I collect those three lessons for um, every diplomat and three lessons for every ambassador. And it's absolutely essential for you as an ambassador to completely understand the country or to understand it as best you can. And then to use that knowledge to try and improve relationships between that country and your country and to try and develop solutions which will help both sides. So no doubt the ambassador at the moment is working very hard to ensure maximum British support for um, Ukraine in their moment of need now. And that's going to be an enormously important task. Sorry, somebody's doing some drilling here. I hope you can still hear me. Um, amazing noises. Um, and um, finally, what are the challenges for the world? I mean, the combination of the Ukrainian war, uh, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the war in the Middle East are enormous. And we all stand on the brink of much worse wars. Um, you know, we are in danger of World War III. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's an incredibly unstable moment. I remember thinking in 2014, when Russia first invaded Crimea and eastern Ukraine, that this felt like the beginning of World War III. And um, in order to fight against that, to try and keep peace, <laughs> this is not music, this is somebody drilling upstairs, I'm afraid. Um, the, uh, the, um, it's probably the, Probably the Russians have sent somebody around with a drill here. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, we... we can have... say that if you have someone drilling nearby, then it's a sign of optimism. So that's, <laughs> you know... Well, that's, good. that's good. Thank you very much. Uh, we, can, we can use some optimism. Um, so to increase stability, we have to keep talking to each other and we have to try and slow things down. If you ask me what was the biggest problem for the world at the moment, I would say that it's... Um, it's the way that people are getting their news from social media. And everybody feels the need to have an opinion on absolutely everything and to decide instantly what they think about everything. And this creates enormous instability in the political uh, framework in which we're all operating. And people need to take their time. I mean, when I look at what happened with Israel on the 7th of October last year, it would have been extremely difficult for Israel not to respond to the Hamas attack on the 7th of October. You know, it would have required incredible wisdom. Um, and instead, of course, they've gone and attacked Gaza in this enormous way, and they've lost a lot of support around the world as a result of doing that. Whether it would have been possible to do anything else is a very difficult judgment. And now we have the same situation where uh, Israel has um, attacked the Iranian consulate in uh, Damascus, and then Iran has attacked Israel, and now Israel is deciding what to do. I mean, my advice in all of these situations is to take your time. You don't have to do everything immediately. If you take your time, a lot of problems will just disappear, and um, you won't have escalation. So taking your time is a really difficult thing, 
But um, this knee-jerk response that we feel impelled to do because of social media creating pressure on decision makers is an extremely dangerous thing. Thanks, Serge. I probably we should end there. But um, I'd just like to say thank you again to everybody for listening in. Do, do pre-order my book if you're interested. Um, as I say, there's a 50% discount for everybody listening to this lecture. And Serge can help you to, to get that discount. You have to go to the Bristol University Press site and, um, and order it there. Um, or if you want to buy a full price copy, you can get it from Amazon as well. So thank you very much, Serge. And is there anything else you'd like to say?